I can see it. Okay, welcome everybody to our monthly book club discussion. Uh, we are a week late, so I apologize for that, but this is normally a book club discussion that we do the last Thursday of every month at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The book that we're going to be discussing tonight is called The Anger Trap by Dr. Les Carter. Um, so it's going to be an interesting discussion. We had some mixed feelings about it. And the book that we're going to be discussing next month is called Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. This is, uh, I would say, one of the top five maybe even top three trauma books out there. It's fantastic. I've read it multiple times. And every single time I read it, I just take away a whole new set of information. So it's absolutely fantastic and it's a must read. So, uh, and just as a reminder, uh, audible.com sponsors this book club. So if you are interested in a free audiobook, you can go to audibletrial.com slash thrive after abuse or use the code thrive after abuse if you're over on Audible. They have over, I think it's a hundred thousand books. And uh, they just released a program where it's $14.95 a month and you get an audiobook. And then I think that they're starting a new Audible channel where there's Audible only content. So I still need to kind of dive into that and see what that's about. But so with that said, uh, oh, I want to put, post a link to my notes real quick. They are on my website. I'm going to post them in the chat. You can find my notes at thriveafterabuse.com uh, under book club, but I'm going to post them here in the chat if I can. And so with all of that said, welcome Shay and Agatha. Thank you for being here. And we're waiting for James. He should be here hopefully uh, shortly. Let's see if I can. Okay, yeah, good, the link. The, Sam asks, who's the author? The author of The Anger Trap is Les Carter. And the author of the uh, complex PTSD book is Pete Walker. So, okay. I guess, shall we? jump into it. What did you guys think? And what were some of your takeaways? <laughs> go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Agatha. <laughs> All right. Um, this was my least favorite book so far. Um, I, I, okay, so my my very first, I guess, um, experience of the book is that I kind of feel like this book is what's like it, it shows a lot what is the problem right now with how people are relating to some of the angry interactions by calling it like you know like almost like a normal relationship dynamic so my, my biggest problem was that this book really didn't say anything about how this is abusive lots of lots of examples that are really abusive and even though it serves kind of like a um, few pretty good ways to deal with anger, I felt like it's it served in a very dangerous place. Like it doesn't address the, um, just, you know, like the, uh, the, the abuse that it's, an, it's a verbal abuse, it's emotional abuse. It doesn't address that at all. So I almost felt like, if you want to eat healthy, you're not going to go to like McDonald's and try to find this one healthy option. Like you want to go somewhere where you have a bunch of, bunch of healthy options to, to pick from. And I think if you want to learn about anger, this may not be the best book to, to be honest with you. Because, I, yeah, you will need to like sort through and be very vigilant to not to guilt trip yourself. and um, Or pick up the wrong messages. Yes, or, and yeah. I, I'm, I'm glad you put notes and I just look at them briefly and I think the notes are really great. So I, I, would, I wouldn't almost recommend read the book. I would recommend read your notes. Yeah. Really. yeah I, could, I could actually support that too. I mean, I think there's a lot of useful stuff in the book, but only if it's taken in the context of dealing with someone who, who is at least somewhat healthy. If you try to do this stuff with somebody who's toxic, 
it's not going to go good. <laughs> I mean, I, I would not rec- recommend this for anybody who's still in an abusive relationship or just out of one because it's not it's, it's really not going to be helpful in that context, in my opinion. You know, and you're right. And I should go back and edit my notes and put that at the top because that was one of my concerns as well. When I was reading it, there were some yeah. different stories he had in there and this one couple near the beginning, you know, he was incredibly verbally and emotionally abusive and you're right. Mm-hmm. He didn't identify it. And, um, and, you know, <laughs> I thought the same thing, like this needs to be called out for what it is and she can have the validation that, because I did feel like it was a lot of, uh, oh, well, you know, he picked up these messages from childhood and it was kind of minimizing and excusing it. And while all of that might be true, it's, it doesn't excuse abuse. And for her to stay in that environment um, and be on the receiving end of, such lashing out is, uh, is a problem. Yeah. So, and it also puts all of that responsibility completely on her when it's not, I mean, she's yeah, not responsible yeah. for his behavior. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think that, that, that there was a clear enough line drawn a- around that. And I think that it would have, uh, it even taken in the right context. I think it should have been said, something should have been said about, how to distinguish what is or isn't abuse and whether or not you should evaluate, you know, do I need to be here in this position at all? And that really was, was not said. And I think that brings the book down a lot from what yeah. it could be. It makes it dangerous. That's what I was yeah. thinking. Yeah, it definitely can in our types of situations. He does mention, um, uh, well, I was going to say, he mentions later in the book, like different ways we can handle it, but he never really talks about actually just leaving the relationship. Mm -hmm. He mentioned, okay, well, you can either continue to assert yourself and draw boundaries with an aggressive person. Um, And, and if you realize they're not hearing you, like you can continue in, you know, basically like you continue to frustrate yourself and annoy them. But with people like this, this stuff escalates and people can get killed. Like it's a yeah. big deal. Yeah. I think there was one spot in there where he mentioned in passing, I think it was the woman's name was Carol, where she had decided it would be uh, too hard or painful to divorce at that point. And he didn't really get into the reasons or, or even discuss having sat with her and evaluated that you know, well, what is it that makes you feel that, that that staying is a better choice than whatever would be hard about leaving? And maybe that's worth examining. And just totally blew past that sort of a thing. And I think that's, you know, yeah. I mean, if, if somebody feels like they have to stay in a situation and deal with difficult people for whatever reasons they think that, to do that without being able to evaluate the situation and what really is or isn't dangerous and why. And I mean, that to me, that's a problem that I had. Yeah. Also like he, I think he was really, he, he, he has his own personal stand about certain things. Mm -hmm. And I think about relationships, actually, he, he, he sounds like a Christian and, but he wasn't like, like he was calling some of Christian truths in the book, but mm-hmm. he was the kind of a guy who would basically do everything just to save a relationship. That's what yeah. I thought he was trying. Yeah. To and he didn't say it like directly, but in an indirect way, like you could really sense it over there because everything he, he basically presented in the context of saving a relationship. Mm-hmm. or understanding why someone is angry, like giving grace to yourself, humbling yourself. Be more patient when yes. maybe that's the exact opposite of what this particular person needs to do. Yes, and I, I thought that was so, that, that was making me crazy, actually. I was reading this book and I was getting triggered by it because I felt this is the problem with therapists because you go to the therapist and the therapist will tell you, Oh, you know, they may react angry, but it's not personal. They had a horrible childhood. So you just have to be a little bit more understanding. And, you know, so basically they, like some of the things he showed there, how he worked with people, it was almost like helping us becoming more accepted of someone treating us in an angry way, which is total BS. I'm not going to curse on this channel, but I would curse (laughs) if I could. And then um, the other thing I've had a 
terrible problem with it was that he was actually working with because he explained like a not study cases but like moments from the thera ter therapy sessions from client with clients he was clearly um conscious that some of his clients came to him because they were put on the probation by the employee and mm -hmm. they were aggressive in his anger and the way he was describing them it was like wow you're describing a freaking psychopath you're just not calling it by name you're being very careful because you just you know you just kind of want to maybe focus on a behavior but you're not seeing the whole behavior the, the mm -hmm. whole picture like the, the guy gary or something he was described as he was explosive here uh he had difficult you know but he was charming outside like he was mm -hmm. charming, nice guy, but he was exposing and basically yelling at people and raging at people. And then he he works with him like, like by trying to let him. Sorry, somebody's knocking to my door. Hold on, I'm sorry, I'll be back. <laughs> okay, well, I think you know with um, yes, the it bothered me that he wasn't bringing up the different. Uh, dynamics with abuse because that is a big however I do think the book is written more I felt it was written more towards people who are trying to understand their anger and mm -hmm. not so much partners of people who are angry yeah uh, and, and that's an important thing to understand if you do read this book not not to take it from the standpoint of trying to save a relationship but just to understand anger dynamics it can be there's a lot of scenarios he describes that helped me understand patterns that I went through in my past, just, just to make better sense of it, not to go back and fix it, but just to understand how those dynamics, you know, pass through generations and stuff like that is very helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's talk about that. So what did you, what, uh, Shay, what is one takeaway that you had from the book? Uh, well, basically, because I came from from such a controlling environment and the only way to survive that be, because I couldn't leave I was a child I mean what you there are certain circumstances where you really can't do anything to mm -hmm. leave and childhood is one of them and I ended up learning to cope with that by by doing the friend thing and by you know predicting what things would make stuff around me easier and be less likely to trigger somebody else so that you know and that's a good tactic if you have to use it. But if but when you leave that environment, if you don't if you don't yet understand, OK, that was a tactic and now I need to do something different because I don't want to live in that situation anymore. You'll just blunder into another situation with another person who's controlling and you'll respond that same way and just keep repeating it. Yeah. And, and that passes down that way through generations very easily, you know. Some of the takeaways um, that I had was kind of, I guess, first and foremost, he was saying that anger is the emotion of self-preservation. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really well said. Uh, he says, you know, we often lash out when we feel threatened in some way that's either real or perceived, big or small. It stems from a fear of insignificance. And it's... Um, it's also a sign of a bound. I wanted to just to make it clear that it's also a sign of a boundary violation. Yeah. So it's not just that we're feeling, um, oh, I'm afraid to be insignificant. It's when we're, when we feel angry, that's also a, a good sign to realize, hey, somebody's, it's a, it, the self-preservation part of that. Hey, somebody's crossing lines with me. I need to now do something. Mm -hmm. So Agatha was saying before we went live, she's like, you know, um, anger is, there's a lot of energy and anger. And that's why, because it's supposed to get us into action. It's the fight or flight uh, emotion that mm -hmm. we can move forward and do something. So, um, and the, so anger itself is not an issue. It's when anger becomes abusive and when we start taking it out on other people. And um, he also, I, I had never heard it phrased this way and I really liked it. He said, you know, nobody really sits anybody down and says, hey, this is how you should handle your emotions. This is how you should handle anger, especially. And he says, but we all have our own messages and patterns, like what you were saying, Shay. You know, we, we learn this in these, in our different homes. And he said, it's, he compared it to, it's like a regional accent. 
Nobody sits down and says, okay, this is how you talk if you're from Texas, right? Or this is how you talk when you're from Michigan. It's you pick it up because you're around it. And so then you carry that with you until you're in another environment where other accents kind of rub off on you. And it's the same thing with behaviors. Uh, But once we're aware of, oh, wow, okay, I do have this certain accent from how I was raised, this emotional accent, then conscious choice can start to come in and we can start to be more aware of our behavior. That's right. Well, he, he, it, this, this, this is what was really disappointing for me about this book, because there are some really good things about anger, things that we already know, or like they are put in a new way, but just the context of the book was really dangerous for me. And I'm just going to be repeating it probably. But like one of my, one of my favorite things, um, in this book was um he kind of said how anger oh hi james <laughs> hi he kind of he kind of said how anger has its purpose and we should kind of use it like and don't let the anger control us after it's fulfilled like its purpose something like that he said yes. that a little bit differently but i love that i was like this is perfect Mm-hmm. I agree. I had never heard that before. I actually put that in my notes because I liked it so much. Somebody I had, I was talking, I don't know if it was on the live stream with Angie or we were talking about this the other day. And I had made a comment about how um, there were certain things that certain pain from everything that I went through where I just got to the point where I'm like, you know, I'm and just, it's enough. Like I'm ready to just drive on. I'm tired of picking up every single rock and turning it over and examining it and processing all these feelings. Like, I feel like I've processed enough of the big stuff that I'm okay with just closing the door mm-hmm. on some of the other things and consciously just moving forward with my life. Mm-hmm. And I really struggled with that. And I think some of the people in the chat struggled with that, with kind of wondering like, well, is this being avoidant? Um, is this me trying to bypass emotions? And I, I don't feel like it is. And I, I, you know, I, so. I agree with you. I don't think it is either. It, when you feel like you're ready to put the majority of something behind you, if something comes up that re-triggers a little piece of it and you say, okay, well, if, and when that happens, I'll deal with it as I go along. That's not avoiding. Yeah. That, that's choosing to live now and deal with now. Instead yeah. Of, Instead of like putting your life on hold, I right. I agree with that. And he had said one of the, the takeaways, which was this one from the book was, um, if you guys are following along in my notes, we're hopping around here, but it's point number six. And he talks about uh, the differences between suppressing anger and releasing anger. Yeah. And he says, uh, suppressing a lot of people, I think for those of us that are used to being more on the kind of overgiving side, tend to suppress anger and we not don't even realize it. Yeah. So if we learn somewhere along the line that expressing our emotions is fruitless or uncomfortable, then we might have gotten to the point where we're just used to not feeling our feelings. And um, some signs that we're suppressing our feelings are uh, we withdraw, uh, we refuse to expose problems, we're shying away from controversial topics, we're second guessing ourselves, we're people pleasing, not saying anything, refusing help, pretending to not have any resentment, acting encouraging or pleasant when we don't like the person or don't feel that way, succumbing to the strong will of others, taking care of, taking care of others even though they've wronged us. Um, this type of suppression comes out as depression, anxiety, heart problems, ulcers, back pain, and so on. It also comes out as feelings of futility and resentment Um, that the world is unfriendly and doesn't care about our needs. However, releasing anger isn't being a doormat. It's, and it's not the same as suppressing anger. It's uh, the difference is suppressing anger is motivated by fear and a false front. Whereas releasing anger is consciously setting it aside so that you can pursue other things. It doesn't mean that you are okay with how you were treated. It doesn't Um, But he does make the distinction. He says, in order to release anger, we need to know how to be assertive first. So we need to know how to actually be able to acknowledge how we feel and express it. Because if we can't do that part of it, then we are suppressing it. Mm -hmm. Uh, So 
Yeah. So James, what, what were, what was the takeaway for you? I was kind of listening on the way home driving, um, both hands on the wheel, of course. Uh, good for um, you. But <laughs> I, I agreed with everything y'all said. It was, it was almost like there was a lot of points in the book where I was like, it's obvious that the person that's either in counseling or the partner is a toxic person. And this is like, this stuff is not going to work with them. It's they're They don't have the ability to, to even care to change. They're going to, they may like act like they're going to change, but it's just not in their, they, it's not possible for them. It's frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Actually, some of this stuff, if you try and do it with somebody who's toxic, they, they will actively sabotage you in such a way that it can really not go any place good at all and, yeah. and cause a lot of problems. So, Or you go backwards. Yeah, and, and I, I think that's, that's something that would have been better if it was pointed out while he was going through this stuff so that yeah. it would be less likely for somebody to take it in that direction. Well, it's like we mentioned earlier, they almost, he almost needs to add a chapter of the book of like, you know, toxic people, um, relating to anger. Mm -hmm. I think that would have been very helpful just to kind of help out. Cause otherwise, you know, like we just said, it's going to be problematic. Well, and I think, you know, there's a lot of people, unless you are on the receiving end of these kinds of people, um, I just don't think. I really feel that a lot of mental health professionals in general and people in the world tend to have this view of, oh, well, these are just these unresolved childhood issues and like we can work on it and this can be solved. And, you know, these are these different strategies and it takes two to tango and all of this stuff. And it's like, unless you're on the receiving end of, and you really see just how deeply dysfunctional um, and malicious some of these people can be, it's hard to even fathom it. So I really just wonder if he's ever even experienced that because I think anybody that has would make sure to, to couch whatever they're saying in that context. Um, Yeah. As far as it taking two people to tango, it only takes one person to break intimacy. Yeah. Yeah, And I think things he described, like there was such a, such a very small thing for him. Like he completely did not understand that was financial abuse the woman who went did some shopping and the man raging because she spent money on um, diapers or something. She bought more because he was on sale. And I was thinking like, how controlling, like he didn't see that as control problem at all. Yeah. Nothing. And he no. never brings it up in counseling. <laughs> like what Nothing. You- no, he, no, he didn't. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Hello, abuse. <laughs> yeah. The, the things that he was telling her to do, I didn't think were helpful in that context. Uh-huh. Um, Personally, I mean, I think because he was of- asking her to keep bending over backwards and be more patient. And, and yeah, I mean, it was yeah, good that he was encouraging that. her to develop herself mm-hmm. as a kind person. But there are some people that does not really work with. And no, that and that needed say, to be said. Any personality style that's that controlling and domineering that would yeah. rage over diapers is it's a it's abuse and like that there is no getting through to that because that's such that. ba- yeah you can't fix that like that's no. such basic um kind of basic understandings of how to be appropriate that that's that's t- to me that's just slam dunk kind of deal breaker stuff and um but yeah, so let's talk about or was it where it was it was like the council where she was like he was trying to explain like basic concepts of um being understanding yeah, to an adult. <laughs> <It's> like what <laughs> you can't, if somebody doesn't get that you're not gonna get through to them if, if you have to explain human decency to an adult yeah. opt it, out <laughs> that's my you're wasting suggestion. your time <laughs> well and there's a lot to learn he mentioned something later on in the book about because you know um one of all of i think all of our issues with the book is he doesn't talk about actually having deal breakers and leaving yes, and being yeah. like, well, you know what? Yeah. You might not have learned these skills and you might've had a bad childhood and all of the stuff that we might've gone on, but you know what, this is not reasonable. And I need to get clear with where my line in the sand is. And I wish you well, and I hope you grow, but I'm done. Um, 
Dana, right. I think he goes farther. I think he actually caused the woman who left problematic situation, like this family gathering, she left early. She He kind of treated it like it was overreacting. I, don't I know I know the example you're talking about. Yeah. She was at some kind of family picnic or gathering and she yes. had had a long history of really problematic relations with her mother. Mm -hmm. And some I, I don't remember what it was or if it even said what specific thing happened during the beginning of that event where she just realized this is not Maybe. going anywhere good and I need to get out of here. So she mm -hmm. took her family and left. And I thought that was completely appropriate. Was like, yes. And his his attitude was, well, you should have hope that if you change yourself, her response will be different. Well, that only works when you're dealing with somebody who can relate. You know, if you're, I, I, I agree with you about that example that um, I had a problem with that one too. Well, and Agatha earlier was talking about him being a Christian and me and um, my ex went to the pastor that actually married us. And he gave pretty similar advice where it was, you know, 50, 50. And I think a lot of that is, is just, a, um, unfortunately it's kind of a Christian thing where, um, you know, you should ride it out until the end and it takes two and, um, you're equally as guilty and it's not always the case at all. So yeah, yeah. it's unfortunate. I right. And I think that's such an important point because so many targets feel responsible for the abuse. You know, like you get yelled at because you went and bought diapers and yeah. didn't check with this person before. There's always kind of like, you can, if you kind of squint your eyes, you can kind of make sense of why this person might be angry. And you think, well, if I just do better next time, then I won't get yelled at. And this is how this whole erosion of a person's self starts happening and their anxiety increases. They're walking on eggshells. They're trying to make this impossible situation work because their partner has absolutely zero emotional regulation and they just feel entitled to lash out and try to control their every move. And that stuff's just, it's really just not workable. And it just revalidates it when you go to a counselor for yes. help and they it's, just make you and feel. Nowhere in there did he talk really about helping, helping those clients understand what parts were their responsibility and what were not. And it's, yeah it is very important to be able to distinguish that. Sure. And when you're dealing with a controlling person, they do everything they can to make you responsible for everything. Mm -hmm. And that that's something that's got to be overcome. If you're, if you're dealing with somebody who's really controlling and you don't do that piece. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can't yeah. be humble. I wish he had, he had this really great chapter about, uh, the difference between uh, being forceful and like aggressive, angry and assertive. Mm -hmm. And that was a great chapter, but I, I wish he put a different, also um, the, the like humble, graceful way of being assertive and like being a, like a, a doormat basically, because the way he explained humbleness, I, I don't think he realized, but he basically trained the woman to just take abuse. And I don't think that was the true humbleness. I think he was training her to just like take it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I, I did think that he put too much he was putting a lot of pressure on her to be accommodating in ways mm -hmm. that that did not assign this this guy any responsibility for abuse even if he didn't want to use that word he, you know it, it yeah I I really did feel like he was putting and, and I understand the concept of, of radical ownership and using your own choices. And that's great if a person's gotten to the place where they can see their own choices. And that's, you know, well, we that's know not how that where goes this with was. a toxic person. <laughs> right. That, it doesn't if you're, at if you're all. <laughs> in a relationship with, with a controller, you can't do that. I mean, you, yeah. you and, and that I think really should have been, if things like that had been addressed, I think this book would have been a lot more useful mm -hmm. than it is because there is a lot of good stuff in it. There is. Uh, let's, let me touch on a few of the take the good things. things. Yeah. That we can use and did like, um, one of the points he mentions in here is, um, and I don't know if he directly mentioned it or if it was just something I kind of interpreted, but he, I guess my takeaway was that it's really important to look at how a person handles conflict and how they respond to you setting boundaries with them. Um, 
basically, can they negotiate effectively when it comes down to reasonable conflict? Because conflict in itself is not inherently bad. Conflict, right. when, when you have two authentic people showing up and being themselves and expressing their thoughts and opinions and wants and needs, there's going to be differences of opinion. And that's, that in itself is not a problem. It's how we handle that that can become a problem. And so for a relationship to even have the chance at being healthy, those two people need to be able to be comfortable with acknowledging differences when they exist and then being assertive enough to address them and then resolve them. And so I thought that was important because so many times we – um, I, you know, I see in the chat and a lot of people that are new to this, they, they come in and they're very focused on, okay, I need to know top, top red flags of a relationship or top red flags of a narcissist, or um, is this a problem or is this a problem? And how did he treat the waitress? And like, these small signs are helpful, but it's only a very small part of the picture. It's like, you really don't know a person until there is conflict and, and how they're able to resolve it. And conflict, absence of conflict is also a problem. Yeah. This was something, an aha moment that I had not too long ago. Um, I just, you know, I'm not a fighter, but I realized I was suppressing a lot of things and, mm -hmm. and didn't realize all the different ways that was coming out. So uh, it's important for people to be able to say, hey, this is what's going on. This hurt my feelings. This is What's what I'm thinking about, or hey, we need to kind of get together and you know figure this out or or whatnot. Um, this is this is really great, I think, especially because if if like it's okay to be angry with someone and you have a right to express it in a mature way, and I think this is great way to say if the other person is mature, because a mature person will have empathy for your anger and will get it, but will not fight it. Like they will just kind of understand that you may be angry, upset about something, but it's not going to be this like explosion, basically. Yeah. And cause some of those, like some of those interaction, like he was, like, he was uh, describing, I was almost thinking like, dude, are you making it up? Because if this guy is really acting the way he's acting and now you're describing this conversation you're having with him or they, or he's having with his wife, I'm like, I think you're making it up because I agree. This guy was like, he has no empathy. And if he has no empathy, he's not capable of that kind of change. I'm or like, the person was lying to, the, to <laughs> the author. Yeah, which one is entirely two. possible, especially if it was one of the ones mandated for some reason to go yes. to a... He there, like there was this huge disconnect between the yeah. level of self-awareness they seem to have around the therapist and the complete lack of emotional intelligence outside of the office. And yes. I, agree, I agreed with that too. I was like, either this guy is way fabricating yeah. these stories or they're a combination of, you know, 20 different people and he put it all yeah. into one or these clients, but even still, like, cause I've worked with people like this, like patient wise. And I mean, I'm sorry. I'm pretty much. Still don't have I they wouldn't stand that nice in his office. Even me, I wouldn't even stand that nice. Like if I would come there, like really dealing with something angering me and I have lots of empathy, I don't think we would go from point A to point B in the way he described. I agree. I don't think so. I yeah. agree. Realistic. I think that's, that's a good very, point. Yeah. Very rare. I, yeah. I think he kind of oversold his, uh, his approach. And He's like one of those guys who claim that they can treat narcissists. Yeah, that's very similar for me. Very I've got it. I got to run real quick. I just I'll be right back. But you guys keep talking. I'll be back in like two. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. But yeah. So you know what I thought about this book on the way home? It it would be a really it'd be kind of dangerous, but it'd be a really good test to see if you can recognize toxic behavior and recognize how somebody can be so just unaware of it, you know? Yeah. I mean, Although, if, if like I said, it's, it's kind of a dangerous book, thing. If somebody sat down and went through it in order to make a list of red flags from what these scenarios were presenting, that would be kind of useful. <laughs> well, yeah. it, it, I think one of the biggest thing why this book was really confronting to me is because I know for a fact, if I have read this book like four years ago, I would take to heart 
every lesson he gave there and I would be this really obedient yep. nice person to my ex-husband and every other person who abused me because I would be humbling myself and trying to understand their um, I did all of that at one time I, 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 I think we all did tried all of that and and yeah. that's why I'm agreeing with you so much is that yeah, the I, only I, useful useful thing about my having done all that is I proved to myself that it wasn't me because yeah. I tried every single thing there was, you know, and maybe yeah, that's something I needed to do so I can understand if somebody does, but I wouldn't, I mm -hmm. wouldn't, as especially as a therapist, I wouldn't encourage that. And I would at least try to encourage somebody to look at all their options. And if they were very resistant to something like leaving, even just to look at it as a potential option, that doesn't mean you have to choose it, but just right. look at it. If, well, if somebody can't even do that, that needs to be examined. Well, and that's the tough part is you, you can't make somebody else see it. You kind of yeah, have to go through it, unfortunately, yeah. to, to get to that's that true. place. Mm -hmm. so. and, and unfortunately, I think a lot of people like, because I did have to go through trying all of those things before I finally understood there ain't nothing you can do, honey. You, it's, there's nothing you can do about this yeah. other person. And I had to learn that the hard way. And I think a lot of people do. I think I, the biggest problem I had with him when he was teaching that lesson of that humbleness, and this is why he kind of said that every human being comes up to the world with uh, this like natural program in tendency to being egoistic selfish and proud and i was thinking i that i don't agree with that because i think we all come with this need to be accepted and with like a feeling that we are worth some something mm -hmm. but that 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 feeling of being worth and that uh you know that us trying to protect our worth is being corrupted when our yeah. parents don't teach us the proper way of self-care so then we kind of get a little bit maybe aggressive or uh, maybe in like just maybe more proud or like maybe more like, more like forceful maybe because we just have so much more to push through so instead of you know parents teaching children to self-care we become this you know not taught by parents forceful little creatures that try to keep up you know, the self-worth. And I think mm -hmm. that's when it's really, really malignant. Like, like when it continues for a long time, it may become this proud. But I don't think it's like we're born proud and self- I don't either. And arrogant. I'm like, no, hello, no. No, anybody who spends any time around several different, very small children will see very quickly how different their personalities can be. And, and I agree with you. People are not just automatically no. born that way. I, I don't know. I mean, Even all humans have this, like this need to like, um, nurture themselves or kind of take care of themselves, but not to a super selfish level. I mean, they yeah. pretty much rely on their parents for the first, what, like couple, probably more than that years to, to survive and get what they need. Yeah, and he yeah, especially with them. somebody who there, there are a lot of people like me who were not allowed to express assertiveness or anger. So mm -hmm. that's actually the opposite for me of, you know, because I, w <clears throat> I had to learn how to do that. I, I didn't, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> well, definitely when we have to do it on ourselves, like on our own, tr we try and we make mistakes. So we, we may be a little bit too forceful trying to like preserve our worth too mm -hmm. aggressive in some ways or or go the complete opposite but i don't think teaching us humbleness then it's the right way i think teaching us a proper responsible mature way of self-caring and healthy boundaries that's a way now okay. yeah. a good balance yeah. yes so that was my biggest problem i think yeah. yes i think about how we he said that every human being is born like proud and selfish and like we kind of had problem with it all. I mean, I had and all of us together. <laughs> yeah. So I was kind of worried. I'm so glad that you guys are basically thinking and saying the same stuff that I was thinking when reading the book. I was kind of nervous. Like I'm going to be the only one that it was my least favorite book that we've read so far. Mm. Yeah. Oh, you missed uh, all the chats I was sending like a last month. I hate this book. I can't stay. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it's got, it's got some good information, but it's in it, but, 
yeah the things that were left out i think detract from what there actually is Mm -hmm. you know and and if you're at a place where you can read it you know with that in mind yeah pick up the good parts and it can be useful but um I, i really would not recommend it to somebody who's in a relationship with somebody who's controlling or abusive or any of that or even just recently out of it you know it's yeah. more useful when you've gotten to a pretty solid place in your healing where where you feel strong in yourself and and then you want to learn how to you know tweak your process not you're not looking to fix you know it, yeah. it's, this is not something i'd recommend for fixing relationships with problem people at all <laughs> No, I agree. And I, and I, 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 you know, I think that's uh, what definitely one of my main takeaways is I think all of our takeaways is uh, with any, with any of this stuff, with any book is it's got to be couched within the understanding of healthy boundary standards and deal breakers. And um, without that, we're just lost. We're just yeah. fumbling around and we're looking to other people to tell us what's a problem. And our, our lives are not going to work until we're able to turn inward and get in tune enough with ourselves that we know what's a problem for us and where that line is in the sand, regardless of anybody else in the room that might disagree with us. Yep. There's just there's just no shortcut around that. So, um, yeah, knowing when we're being mistreated, knowing how to handle it when it starts happening Uh, Because it will happen, but, you know, conflict is going to occur and, and um, yeah. Knowing when we're not responsible for something and, you know. Knowing what we can control and what we can't control. Yeah. Yeah. Being flexible in our understanding is great, but we have to also know when we start like twisting ourselves into like pretzels, like those mental gymnastics just to make sense of what's happening and, you know, just to not feel as angry as the other person's feeling because mm-hmm. i think that he really got me with the name of the book anger trap like mm-hmm. i love the name of the book i was thinking mm-hmm. yeah because anger it could be just like this freaking trap when it's unprocessed it it hurts your body it hurts your health it hurts your mind when it's like you know and it hurts relationships that could actually otherwise be good if you haven't processed anger from you know what happened to you or from like you know all the different circumstances because we have plenty of things in our life to get angry over and he addresses that he actually says that anger there's nothing wrong with being angry like he actually says that right yep so and it's important it's important that we experience anger when it surfaces, but that we experience it and express it appropriately. I think that's the part that so many, you know, it's not taught. So when we feel angry, because, you know, the differences between passive aggressive and um, assertive and aggressive communication isn't taught, people are like, well, I feel angry and that's why I did this. And that's definitely the abuser mentality. Um, but the alternative is, yes, you have every right to feel angry and frustrated and hurt. However, you don't have the right to then lash out abusively towards others. Uh, that's the line. And if that's how a person's going to handle it, then it's up to us to say, okay, to realize this person, you know, has, we're not on the same page here with how we handle our emotions and what appropriate adult behavior is. And so then I need to start distancing myself because they don't get it. They have no desire to get it. And that's the challenge too with anger is um, when a person, when we feel angry, we go into fight or flight mode. And this is one of the things that we learned in that book, the body keeps the score. When a person goes into fight or flight mode, their, the neocortex, the logic and critical thinking part of their brain goes offline. Mm -hmm. So they're not thinking they are completely reactive. And, and so it's really important that we understand that. So if we're expecting higher level for other people and for ourselves, when a person's angry, these higher level emotions that are found in that prefrontal cortex, empathy, um, a sense of connection, bonding, the ability to think clearly and rationally and logically, those are not there. They are offline. And because when we're angry, we're in fight or flight. We have different 
chemical responses going through us, we don't have the bonding chemicals of, you know, oxytocin and dopamine. They're not, all of that stuff's not present when we're, it's cortisol, it's adrenaline, it's a to, it's just a different system flood that's happening. And so a lot of, here's, here's the thing too, with a lot of, um, a lot of us, when we handle things in ways that we get upset about, we're like, wow, I can't believe I did that. I should know better. I should know that uh, I can't have certain conversations with my dad and I, or my spouse or whatever. And I fell for it again. And we get so upset at ourselves or we do something. And I talk about this a little bit in, in my latest book, but like when we do things that don't make sense to us, that's why. This is why people go rushing back into a burning house to save a photo album. This is why they jump in a raging river to, to say, you know, their wallet falls into the river and they jump in to get it. They're not thinking clearly. And so it, it's important that we have compassion for ourselves when we don't handle things that in a way that we wish we would. But it's also important that we understand that when somebody else is full of rage, especially if we're talking about somebody who's under the influence, trying to be reasonable, reasonable and rational is only going to add fuel to the fire. Well, not only that, but when you're dealing with somebody who's very controlling and they are manipulating you, they will trigger that response in you on purpose because then you can't yes. make a reasonable argument. You can't think your way clearly through it. It, it puts you at a complete disadvantage. And I think that's something that's really not discussed enough. You know, yes. And then you get blamed. Right. And, and you, you can't... Uh, and even trying to remember the conversation, you know, when we find ourselves going back over a conversation, what happened? You know, how did this get to this point? Part of the reason we find ourselves in that fog is we were placed in that fog by being made to disengage our, our reasoning abilities yeah. by somebody who is out to control us. And, yes. you know, that that's a sucky thing to have to realize. But it's powerful. Yeah. And, and um, but one of one of the. The things he talks about, you know, is once we're aware of this, then we can start to practice it. And this is one of the ways, because uh, poker players also deal with that. It's other players will, it's a strategy called getting somebody on tilt. If you, if anybody else is out there that plays poker um, and what they'll intentionally do is they'll just needle that person and they'll just make comments. And the whole goal is to get that person emotionally reactive where they start betting in very erratic ways and start making poor decisions. Hmm. And yeah. so yeah. poker players anticipate will anticipate this and try uh, different strategies that they might have um, put headphones in so they don't even have to hear it or they just start they start practicing under pressure. And it's it's the same thing too with like um, first responders. So when you have firefighters, EMTs, uh, when you're under pressure like that, because we're not thinking, we're completely reactive. They, it's drill after drill after drill after drill after drill on how to have these interactions, so we can override that reactive part of us. But mm. it, it takes so much practice, and we, this is what we do when we start talking about developing a safety plan and anticipating. Okay, this is what I know I'm going to walk into. What are some things I can say? What? How can I get up and leave the room? How can I handle this? It's doing these mental drills, and then it helps to do it under pressure. Yeah. So having somebody intentionally try to throw you off, it it's just sharpening your your skill set when you when you have to deal with uh, somebody that's like that. That's a good point. It's fascinating when you realize the power of our brain and mm -hmm. what's going on, like what parts are online and offline and how we can override that and become more conscious on a more regular basis. And we also need to know the limitation of our brain. That's what I'm more aware mm -hmm. of. Like we need to remember mm -hmm. that, you know, emotions, when they are strong, they can really take us offline. So I guess yeah. here, here is, here is what... I think it's very important for survivors for us. And I think that would be such a great different kind of book about anger. It would be about that anger trap that we as survivors deal with, you know, that unexpressed anger and that anger of like re reacting to abuse. Right. Yeah. Cause that's, 
that's that's what we struggle with like you know yeah. trying to have a conversation like let's say you call parenting and you know and the guy or the, the the mom or the dad you know of your child is is that person that abused you and you have to interact with them what do you do with that anger right mm-hmm. like how do you assert yourself and you know keep up your boundaries and keep yourself protected and and also like how do you not let that anger just stay inside of you and don't be expressed in any way because you know you have to watch out what you're saying you cannot express this anger when your child is around like you have to be really really creative with healthy and mature ways of expressing your anger and i wish this book was more addressing those kind of moments because for me, understanding why someone is angry wasn't it like that's what would put me back into being in abusive relationships. But for me to understand how can I express my anger in a healthy way, that's what's gonna make a difference for my life and for like a bunch of survivors I know out there. Yeah, for your life, not for theirs, because right, it's gonna be pointless. And I, I think, I think this is where I like this is what was missing in this book for me um uh, you know to bring that self-compassion to yourself so i'm i'm, I'm gonna just put it in here i'm gonna remind it because that was the book we did a while ago and that book wasn't that great either but that message of you know bringing self-compassion to every emotion you're having is just is just good because when you have this anger this this anger really like it, it can really break you down because it's like something is boiling and cooking inside of you. It makes you feel white. It's, it just, it just doesn't make you feel good. So in that moment, like I, and I've had those moments every day. We all have it in that moment. You need to find a way how to calm down yourself in a way that is healthy, not suppressing the anger. Like you still accept that anger. You honor yourself and that anger inside of you, you honor the message. If this anger is caused by, Someone treated you badly. Don't let them do it again, right? But you still have to deal with this bad energy like inside of you. I'm not bad, but this energy, it's not bad. It's just energy. So you have to find a way how to calm yourself. So now, Shai, you, you, Shai, you go for a dragon walk. I, do you? Because yeah. that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my go-to saying before, before I try and make a decision or do anything else, I, I, I go on a very, very aggressive walk to just release that energy. And then I'm in a state where I, where I feel able to turn my reasoning back on and say okay well what are my choices what what can I do for myself to make my situation better and And, you know and I don't know if it was in the body keeps the score or something else I was reading but um there was a study done about PTSD uh uh, survivors of 9-11 and survivors of Hurricane Katrina and they found that there were far more people that had come forward with PTSD from Hurricane Katrina than 9-11, which was, is fascinating because the death toll for 9-11, I mean, it was, I mean, the both events were horrific, but I would have guessed that 9-11 would have caused more PTSD um, just because the sheer number of people involved. But so one of the, one of the things that they had looked at was kind of, uh, why this was. I think it was in the body keeps the score. Yeah, and, I, I think so. Yeah. And um, that what they were thinking was because the stress hormones of adrenaline and cortisol, if we're unable for those that are not able to get that out. So hurricane Katrina, they were stuck there. They couldn't, they couldn't discharge that energy versus people from nine 11 those that survived were running, they were able to go home, they were able, they were able to be active and burn that energy off. And so then they're thinking there's this connection between these just different stored chemicals in our system. So I think that's fascinating because it really gives a lot of uh, weight to exercising and the benefits of exercising and burning this stuff off because it does, it just sits in our body mm-hmm. and it's, um, it doesn't just go away. Yeah, I agree. I exercised a lot right around the time that, um, Mm -hmm. that we, that we broke up. Yeah, it's good. It's a good, it's a healthy way to get, to get rid of that energy. Um, I did want to talk about, I thought he really, um, laid out the differences 
or some of the behaviors between passive aggressive, aggressive, and assertiveness that I thought was worth talking about. So let me just run through these. Um, so I think aggressiveness, we'll just start there. Some examples are um, pleading or coercion, which I thought was interesting, the pleading part, but it's basically not respecting boundaries. It's continuing on. Uh, respect is not maintained. Aggressiveness, it's uh, ignoring or discounting others' needs. It's rigid and demanding. It's destructive in nature and it's harsh. Passive aggressive, this kind of behavior is where a, a person takes a stand without risking being vulnerable. So some ways that a person can be passive aggressive is being silent when the other person wants to hear from you, making lame excuses to avoid activities, procrastination and being chronically forgetful, saying yes when you don't intend to follow through, doing tasks on your own time, even if it disrupts others, talking about people behind their back, saying whatever the person wants to hear and then doing whatever you feel like, being evasive, putting off responsibility and choosing playful or lazy options instead, repeatedly using I don't know to explain choices. I think that's an important one that we should come back to here in a second. Giving half-hearted effort being generally unreliable, acting good in front of authority figures or accountability partners, and then acting rebellious when out of their presence, being wasteful, even after requests have been made to be more conscientious, uh, using excuses as to why we don't do things. And so actually, let me cover assertiveness and we'll go back to the I don't know one. Assertiveness is no sense of entitlement, or to be so strong-willed that others feel insignificant or invalidated. It's not brutal honesty or telling it like it is, which is often loud and sensitive aggression in an attempt to control others. Assertiveness is a use of tact, respect, and dignity, fairness, open, care, directness, and self-restraint. Uh, it's not pushy. And it's not over anger or aggression. I think a lot of people are like, oh man, I really set him straight or I set her straight. And it's, they're confusing saying what they really feel, but in an aggressive way with being assertive. And it's not a big part of being assertive. I think you could say it's two things. It's in um, being open and honest about what we're really feeling, but also delivering it in a tactful, respectful way. Uh, assertiveness, even tone of voice, respect is maintained, it's succinct, um, it has constructive motives, and it's keeping the other person's needs in perspective. He had mentioned, oh, another point about passive aggressive is continuing to circle around the same point and just hammer the same point home over and over and over again in arguments, even if it's uh, even if a resolution has been reached. And I liked that. I, he's spot on about that. But uh, the point that I wanted to make about the I don't know is this, this is something that I think a lot of us do. And it's really important that we start working to break ourselves of this habit because you do know. So when we say, I don't know, what would you like for dinner? Oh, I don't know. What do you want? Well, how, how did your first date go with this person? Well, I, I don't know. Breaking yourself of that habit because it's a, it's, a, it's a way that we're suppressing what we really feel. So taking some time to step back and gather your thoughts and think about, and I like to do it this way. I like to think, well, okay, but if you did know, what would you say? I like that. And kind of by, bypass that. You can also... Sometimes just don't know first, but it's you shouldn't stop there because sometimes people ask me and I said, I don't know, but let me think about it. And I think yes. that, that's what can be really happening. And I'm going to take it out to a different thing now because I don't want people to think they are passive aggressive just because after abuse, they truly don't know. Good point. Because well, I really true. don't know they know. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I agree. And I wanted to cover that. I, this is yeah. not what I was talking about in terms of um, uh, 
Yeah. Some of these behaviors are, they're, they're not only passive aggressive behaviors. They can exist just sort of like being unreliable. Like that's not necessarily passive aggressive. The person could have a lot going on. They could be terrible with time management. Talking about myself here. Like can be there's no, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, I wish the author had mentioned that or said that. It's important that you realize there's a lot of overlap between um, these things. It doesn't only mean, mean that. So, but the, I don't know, I think what we can say when a person says, I don't know, Mm -hmm. is that tends to be this knee jerk reaction when we're trying to suppress, suppress what we really feel. So I wouldn't worry about it being passive aggressive. I'd be more concerned about that. You're actually suppressing um, your kind of inner wisdom. Yeah, your truth. Your truth. That, thank you, James. That's well said. Yeah, like that's that's the bigger takeaway with that. So catching yourself. And you could even, if you have some people, some emotionally safe people in your life, to mention that to them as well and try to catch each other doing it. So I do it a lot. I, do, I still do mm-hmm. too. And I, and I know... I'm trying to break myself of it, but it's such a default thing for so many of us that are used to putting ourselves on the back burner. Um, but the result of that is that we really don't know. I think I would mentioned this before. There are these certain little moments in my life where I'm like, oh my gosh, how do I not know these things? Like the security questions for banks. They're like, well, what is your favorite color? What is your favorite ice cream? What is there? All of these preferences. And I'm like, I don't know. Like I literally, and I'm having this whole like existential crisis. <laughs> yeah. Trying to like fill out these security questions because I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I totally relate to that. I I went through a period where I realized, holy crap, I don't know what I like about anything. So I I made myself start just making small decisions and experimenting, so that I could just yeah. practice choosing little things when I used to kind of more fall back on the that exact thing of well I really don't know what I prefer right now instead yep. of stopping there now I'll sit and think well what are my options what could I try I don't have to know what my favorite thing would be I can just say what well what's out there and what what do I think I feel like doing right now out of those choices and take the pressure off myself that way because it, it was when you come out of identity erosion it, it takes a lot to rebuild all of that mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. it's totally normal to go through a period of where those choices feel like climbing Mount Everest. And it it takes, it takes time to sort of gradually rebuild yourself that way. And there's, that's not any, that, that's not what any of us are talking about with this. That's not passive aggression. That's just trying to figure out who you are now after that erosion, because, because it is a big deal. It is a big deal. And I think like we were just talking about before with these different parts of our brain that are on and offline after trauma, a significant part of why PTSD is so challenging is the brain fog. And it's because that prefrontal cortex is largely at a minimum, it's diminished. So it's just not as online. So doing, if we can during this time, especially I would say during the first three to six months of anything that's um, really anxiety inducing, leaving abusive relationship, getting a divorce, any type of major situation like that to postpone uh, any type of big decision that we really need to think through because we're just not thinking clearly. So mm-hmm. trying to get to know yourself during this time can, can be added anxiety. So it might help. To, I think it's important, you know, it's, first and foremost, we've got to get that part of our brain back online. Yeah. And um, getting grounded, like getting grounded back on our body, the different guided meditations, um, kind of mind body practices can really help with those feelings of disassociation. And then once we're able to get that part of our brain back online, then starting to really ask ourselves, okay, well, yes, what do I like this? Or do I like that? And realize this is not set in stone. You're not going to, your toes aren't going to be held to the fire. If you change your mind, this is just in this moment, what is your preference? Yeah. You need to make it fun. Permission to, I'm sorry, James, you, you have to give yourself permission to have a preference again. Because mm-hmm. I, I think yes. it's not just that your brain is offline, that's what you done now. It's you're scared to 
you scared to know what you want because you were not allowed to want anything on this for your, for yourself for a very long time most of the time and you had to want exactly what the other person wanted and they had the right to change your mind so what you wanted was change all the time because you know they were going up and down with things so yeah it's just so vital that we are able to tune into ourselves and figure out okay um, you know, what is nourishing for us? What is draining for us? When are we being treated in a way that we're not okay with? When are we being treated in a way that we are okay with? Uh, you know, what makes you, you? I, I forget the book that we read, but the author had described it as, um, it was a book on boundaries. She described it as the jellyfish in the jar. And if we, if we don't know, we have no preference, we're very just go with the flow kind of people, then we're so kind of gelatinous that we don't have a shape of our own. We just take the shape of whatever vessel we're in. And then we're going to relationship to relationship, kind of like a, like a jelly, like an octopus in a jar. Like you're just taking the shape of, of the, you know, the container that you're in and that's a problem. And it's never going to be um, truly fulfilling for us until we can get that solid sense of identity back. Isn't knowing Knowing what you want, in a sense, your boundaries? Yes. it's Your boundaries are an extension of... of Preferences too, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, all of it, so it's very difficult for a person. This is, I mean, this is, I need to really sit down and map this out. Like what comes first, what comes second? Because there is an order of operations to this. Um, because in, until a person, if a person is kind of coming at this from top down Mm -hmm. and they're taking each of these things like you were, like you just touched on, like they're taking it piece by piece. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, I need to pay attention. You know, if a narcissist, the person's not nice to the waitress, or if I need to set this boundary, okay, I should say no to that. I got to remember, I got to remember this. I got to remember all of these different things about boundaries. But if you, if you make the shift and you're dealing with this stuff from bottom up, and you're able to get in tune with yourself and you know when you're being mistreated and you know, okay, these are the ways that I can handle this when it happens, then it just, you become in flow. You're in flow and you don't have to worry about trying to figure out if another person's a narcissist or um, if if something is a problem and we're not seeking validation from without because we have that core sense of ourself that's restored and we know, like, I'm not okay with this. I am okay with it. With it becomes yeah, that, second nature. Then it's yes. not where you have to have this checklist memorized where you have to constantly evaluate everything against this list of things in your mind so that you don't get into this kind of trouble. Instead of that, you can just go with how, how things feel and understanding yourself in the moment and understanding which direction you need to move in. And it's so much easier. Yeah, because that, that would be a long checklist. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, what a lot of, that's what a lot of people do. when they're, yeah. And I think it's just a stage in learning. Yeah. Um, and, and kind of reconnecting with yourself because, again, this stuff's not taught. So people are putting the pieces together in the best way that they know how. And uh, so, yeah, it, you know, really getting in tune with yourself, realizing that um, your boundaries, your boundaries are a reflection of your standards and your standards, your boundaries are the bodyguards of your standards and your standards are synonymous with your self-worth. Mm-hmm. and your self-esteem. And so once you, and here's the thing is we all already have some of this stuff in place. Like yeah. there's certain standards that you have for um, how we, I don't know, how much we weigh, how how we look, how what kind of car we drive, what kind, and I'm not saying it's bad or good. I drive a really old Volkswagen, um, but there's standards that these are kind of these subconscious things that we have with how tidy or messy we are with what across the board. And so it can help to kind of think um, about where your standards are uh, for all of these things, especially with relationships, with what kind of friends that you have and how, what kind of sense of humor you have and what kind of movies you like to watch. And um, I think we, 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 we also need to be aware or we could be aware that, we need to have some boundaries about our anger and also like, you know, like in all the different ways, like what kind of anger is off limit for us. Like we don't even approach those kind of situations. 
like and then you know like how we could um like i don't know what i'm exactly saying here but i think boundaries are really important if it comes to dealing with anger and not you know ending up in that trap of either unexpressed anger or the anger that can hurt you you know from the other person and in in that way i would say that um you remember the mass of pyramid all the needs the mm -hmm. hierarchy of the needs i kind of feel like the boundaries maybe are a little bit similar because first you need to have that safety and that for, for some reason when you were saying like what comes first i was thinking my safety and anger could be something that help you really create a good set of boundaries like and help you move towards safety for yourself and understand that that's what you're doing and yes uh, I know for me that I was very late to learn that. <laughs> yeah. But the challenge with this is, um, yes. So that, yes, anger is, is good in that it helps us to stay, remain self-protective. However, and this is a big lesson. I think a lot of us have, have learned the hard way is we've got to really rein in that standard and realize, okay, here are some of the more mild forms of anger as they surface yeah. and it's you know irritation frustration um resentment when we're starting to gossip about another person when we're needing to call somebody and vent these kinds of things these are all signs that a boundary has been violated these are all the early warning stages of serious anger mm -hmm. and again because this stuff's not taught what a lot of people do is they kind of give another person the benefit of the doubt they want to be polite, they gloss over red flags, they do all these things. And then they, this stuff builds and builds and builds and builds. And then yes, boom. And then they either like, you know what, I'm done. I want a divorce or I'm done. I'm out of this job. And they just explode and they leave. Uh, and it doesn't have to be uh, our point at which we start handling the situation needs to happen significantly sooner than until we can barely hang on. Yeah. I almost feel like we, we, as, as, you know, survivors of all that abuse, we, you know, unfortunately, we already went through those, that moment when there was just lots of, lots of anger in us, right? Mm -hmm. I think most of us. So unfortunately, we kind of backtracking it. Like, first, we had to learn this, like, unresolved, really huge anger inside of us, which I think almost, like, propel us to leave the abuser most of the time. Yes. Or, like, not go back right but then you know during our healing we are learning you know like we set those really strong rigid boundaries first right but then we're learning how to be more flexible with things and like to see the anger early like to you know to already pick up on light violation like like frustration is is already a message to <clears> us we don't wait to that you know huge anger but we like backtracking it well, the more you learn about yourself and, and why you respond to things a certain way and what you can do about that, and you, you, you get more of a sense of understanding yourself and being able to trust yourself to guide yourself through these things. And that does, it does develop. It, yeah. it really does. It might For me, at first, like it, it, was, it wasn't a boundary. It was more of like a, a brick wall with <laughs> yeah. like different layers. <laughs> Nobody getting through it. <laughs> yeah and then you learn that you got to start building windows and you know adjusting things a little bit like you just said well, but i think this is natural and normal right like if a yeah. person i think just instinctually when we realize oh my gosh we're i'm in danger and i don't know how to protect myself we're going to just default and try to protect ourselves in the mm -hmm. way we the best way we know how which is that avoidance and mm -hmm. building up those high walls of uh you know i because we can't tell who's going to hurt us because we don't have this understanding of all of the stuff that we talk about every week. And so once we get a more complete toolkit of, oh, okay, now I know how to keep myself safe. I don't have to stress about trying to be able to discern whether or not this person's a narcissist or a sociopath. Um, it doesn't even have to be that extreme. I just have to figure out when I'm being treated in a way that I'm not okay with and how I can go about addressing that. And that's it. Like, I'm right. thinking moderation, like just comes to me, like it's, it's been, you know, by PMLD and you know, that this is, this is really important message for us survivors, like any kind of reaction we have, we, or like situation we have, we want to really react with moderation <laughs> to what's happening. <laughs> so find yeah. that middle way. 
I think that that was an, that was a big takeaway. Um, uh, when with Pia Melody's book, I had never thought about. I just love her. Um, I had never thought about the importance of kind of emotional maturity being synonymous with moderation. Mm -hmm. and being yeah. able to or express ourselves in a more kind of moderate, balanced way. That is something that has really stuck with me and is something that I'm much more aware of in my own behavior. Mm -hmm. Even though I would consider myself to be a pretty moderate person, there's definitely times, I mean, I just like look back that I have been, I have lashed out and I just have confused being aggressive with being assertive and I, it's just such Somebody a game. that's not going to take it from anybody yeah but i i don't think i i think the message of moderation is like th there's like too much in it most of the time you want to be in that middle stage and she, i like how she uses the lights like you know too many lights in the house or too little lights and she figured out finally mm -hmm. like i don't know seven lights in the house is a moderate like this is good enough but you know once in a while there'll be moments when you have to put all the lights on Sometimes you, sometimes the situation calls you to react in an extreme way. But if you are a usually moderate person, you will be able to discern when is that time. And That's sometimes you will also know where to totally keep cool. And also it's because you are just moderate and mature person. You know, no reaction at all is the best way. So, yeah, yeah, yeah it's, yeah. It's fine. Um, just real quick for people that are chatting here, a local tourist says, have you read Pete Walker's book from surviving to thriving? Well, local tourist, you are in luck because that is next month's book club book. I have it right here. Uh, yes. Complex PTSD by Pete Walker. It is a classic top five, possibly top three different books out there on trauma. We will be discussing this book the last Thursday of this month. Um, I don't know. I don't have the calendar in front of me, but last Thursday of May, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And let's see. It's the 30th. Okay, the 30th. We have three weeks only now. Um, from what? what I remember, I haven't read the book fully. I just, I just downloaded it. But from what I remember, few people in the online community said that, that from surviving to thriving can be pretty triggering. So... For people who want to read it, be aware of that. And, you know, be good to yourself. Be kind to yourself. If you get triggered, just stop, I guess. And we, yeah, well, we can, and if you don't want to read it and just listen to the discussion, you can do that and we'll kind of, you know, be mindful of that. People here talking about uh, they wish they could afford a book or they just don't have the money for this. Please know that you can contact your local library. It's generally free to get a library card. Uh, contact your local library and you can request the book and you can also request the audio book. Mm -hmm. There's an app. I did not realize how tech savvy libraries have gotten over the past few years, but there's an app called Hoopla and it's the audio book app for at least for Michigan libraries. And you so, yeah. Okay. So then you can request this audio book and then they'll let you know, um, when, when it's in and it's unlimited. So you can listen to audiobooks all the time if you want. How long does it take between request and it actually coming in? Uh, it, de it probably depends on the library. It's maybe, I would give them at least a week or so. Um, okay. the, the audiobook thing is kind of a strange one because they literally check it in and check it out like a regular book. Versus, you know, Audible, you can have a million people listening to the same book at the same time. It's not this way. So, uh, but yeah. They have the same server um, capabilities yeah. as That's, the companies do, I'm that sure. That makes total sense. So, so just know that. But uh, yeah. Also, Amazon, um, I haven't done it, but you can loan out a book to somebody if you've purchased it already. So. No oh, that's right. I forgot about that. You are right about that. This in this book too, the complex PTSD book. Last I remember, uh, if a person is enrolled in the Kindle Unlimited plan, which is I think ten dollars a month, and you can read yeah. unlimited books that are enrolled in Kindle Unlimited, yeah. this book is in that. So, 
Um, yeah, so I guess, is there anything else that we want to discuss before we wrap up for tonight? Oh my I would goodness. say for people wanting to read the book next month, try to filter through it sort of like we did and discuss just now. That way you don't get, you don't get triggered. I think, if well, you didn't want to read it. I, I, this is the, this is the biggest wisdom, I guess. You know, I, I, someone told me that a long time ago that, you know, if, if, if we are exposed to something, you know, like some kind of book or like teaching, whatever it is, you really want to be aware of, you know, who are you, where you are and how you listen to it and pick really what's really applying for you. And so that what empowers you, not what like tear you down. That's yeah. really important. So don't use, because you can use anything to beat yourself up completely. Don't do that. Yeah. Just Take something to, you know, to make yourself better. Honor yourself. Yeah, agree. Very good. Yeah. Uh, there's some questions here that I wanted to leave the, uh, On the book. chat with. Uh, yeah, so I'll post them in the chat, but just for people that are listening to this on the podcast, um, he has quite a few questions peppered in throughout the book, and I really did like that feature. It's designed to kind of get a person to become more introspective. And some of the questions that I liked that he'd asked was, um, let's see, there's six of them here. First one is, what messages did you receive about anger growing up? Number two, how can you tell when you are angry? <laughs> Number three, what do you fear most about being open with your anger? Number four, how do you display anger? Number five, which behaviors are most common to you? And number six, how does this affect your relationships? And I'd also add the relationship with yourself. How does this affect your health? I want to just to add that. That was so crazy. <laughs> yeah. So it's worth looking into it because a lot of us, you know, like we were saying, um, we don't get, uh, we don't normally get loud or aggressive or, and some of us really struggle with even telling when we're angry because we don't. So it comes out in much more subtle ways that can just be incredibly destructive. I think it's very common for um, a lot of women in particular for anger to come out as sadness. And for, and then I forget, I think it was that other Pete Walker book we were reading where he was saying, you know, and then sadness tends to manifest as anger in men. So we can kind of get our wires crossed because this, we're not taught how to identify our emotions. Um, well, sometimes I was kind we're of taught also as a... used to. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say sometimes we're taught to sort of abandon our our attention on ourselves when things yeah. when we find ourselves just getting really sort of irritated easily. When I was taught that anger is is bad or like you should yeah. you should like not express when you're angry if it's anything negative in any way, shape, or form. Um. I'm going to say something here because I'm a Christian and I read Bible. Like I love Bible. I study Bible. Nowhere, nowhere in the Bible, God says, do not anger. Nowhere. He said, don't sure. worry. Trust me. Have faith in me. He says, do not act on anger. But nowhere in the Bible, God says, don't be angry. Nowhere. He said, don't be afraid. Don't worry. Nowhere. He says, don't be angry. Just so you know, you have freedom to be angry. Well, free. when you're when you're taught to suppress it, it's just a way to control you and keep you in compliance. So you're easier Plus to deal you, with. <laughs> if you're not used to paying attention to yourself, like it, if if I start to get more irritable than I usually am, I'll stop right there and say, "Okay, clearly I got I have to sit down and figure out what my deal is because I need my attention right now." It I it doesn't get beyond that point now because I give myself that attention. And for most of most of my life, I was trained to do the exact opposite and just ignore my feelings. Mm -hmm. And yep. then it would become a great big thing when I could have, if I had known this, I could have stopped it when it was just at the irritation stage before it became this huge issue. And it would have been no big deal. But but I didn't know that. And yeah. life is much, much easier now that I give myself that attention and I don't abandon myself that way, which I didn't even know I was doing. <laughs> you know? 
Yeah, it's amazing how all of this stuff can just fly under our radar and we don't even realize like, how do I, how do I live in this body? You know? How did I survive all that time? Oh so my many layers. So many layers and just not like Westworld kind of stuff. Like, how do I just not know myself when you start waking up to um, these different parts of yourself? It's just absolutely wild. Yeah. But, yeah and- how, how the heck we became so aware and then, you know, we are aware one week and then we read this book and we find out more things <laughs> we didn't know. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> yeah. basically there's no limits to who we are, I guess. I mean, God is our limit. That's what I would say. But I, I feel that the, the the biggest lesson from like every book so far we read, and even in this one, even if it's not direct, and if, and if it's like kind of hidden in between some of the most dysfunctional stuff there, it's to just be kind to yourself and love yourself through, through, through everything that's happening in your life. You have to just love yourself and love yourself through your anger or sadness. Yep. You have to give yourself some compassion. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And I wish he stated it more obviously in this book, but we're helping him over here. <laughs> yes, we are. Yeah. We're okay. not tearing down, we're adding to. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so if you guys are just, uh, I guess just as a reminder, the book we were discussing was The Anger Trap by Dr. Les Carter. And the book that we're going to be discussing at the end of May, May 30th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is Thursday, is the book Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. So I hope you guys can make it. I will be, um, I'm back in the swing of posting my notes on my website. So um, yes, we'll do that. So thank you guys. Thank you, Agatha and Shay and James for joining me. It was a great discussion uh, as always. Yeah, thanks for everybody in the chat. And um, we'll see you guys next book club. Okay. Lots of love, everybody. Lots of love. (laughs) Okay. Good night. (laughs) Bye.